Thank you, Tui, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation. Um, as Tui mentioned, my husband Anthony and I have been in the food world for some time, and uh, after our daughter was born, we learned what a negative impact the food system has had on the environment. And we really took that seriously, <laughs> and we wanted to do better. And we were asking ourselves, how can we be um, more sustainable, less damaging, less wasteful? And in retrospect, I realized that was the wrong question to be asking. Those were the wrong questions. We really should have been asking, how can we do more good? Um, we, we were stuck on an idea of sustainability as conservation, as um, reducing our harm, kind of staving off the inevitable of climate change. And to be frank, that's a really difficult psychological position to maintain for a long time. And it's hard to run a business that way as well. Um, I think that for many of us, there's something so frightening about climate change that it can be hard to even really focus on it. It's easier to just not think about it. But a few years ago, Anthony and I experienced a kind of eureka moment, and it was actually courtesy of one of our panelists, John Wick, um, when we realized that um, food itself had the capacity to heal the world. Um, as Tui was mentioning, this idea of tikkun olam and making the world um, repaired. Um, so we learned about regenerative agriculture, which was a term I had not really heard before. And what it means is growing food in such a way that it really prioritizes drawing down greenhouse gas, the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. Um, so what we want to do is trade atmospheric CO2 for, which is bad, <laughs> for healthy soil, which is good. Um, and this kind of shift in our thinking from a conservation mindset to a regenerative mindset really reoriented our lives um, and gave us a mission. Um, so we learned all that we could about this emergent, really optimistic science, um, but it was hard to find information. Um, and we reached out to scientists, only some of whom really wanted to talk to restaurateurs, perhaps. Um, but when they did, they often said, you know, I think the data is just not there yet. We just don't know. And they were sort of passive about it. And we felt like, well, shouldn't we get that data? Isn't that the most important information we should be figuring out, like what we can do? Um, so, it was a real relief <laughs> to see the book Drawdown. Um, when we got our first copy uh, of Drawdown, which is a, a project and a book spearheaded by our speaker, Paul Hawken, um, we were really elated. And I say our first copy because we've gone through at least a dozen copies, um, pressing them on people to say, this is really important. This may be the most important thing that we can tell you. Um, and that's really what this whole event is about, is sort of pressing this idea of drawdown um, into people's minds as a different way of thinking about it. Not doing less harm, but doing more good, more regeneration, more healing of the world. So the book provides the scientific backup for what we had understood instinctively. There are, in fact, ways to reverse climate change, but it's going to require that we think about the topic in a clear-headed way. So um, there are the top 100 most effective actions to address climate change, and we were really pleased to see that 11 of the top 25 were related to food. Food, is, um, food and agriculture um, is the most impactful part of it. Um, so, how did Paul Hawken get all of this information? Um, he clearly has a can-do attitude. Just look at all that he has done. He's started ecological businesses, um, including Smith & Hawken, uh, written eight books, including four bestsellers on subjects like nature and commerce. He consults internationally um, with heads of state and others on climate regeneration and has appeared on in all sorts of media from the Today Show to Charlie Rose. 
And that's not even getting into his work on civil rights um, in this country and around the world. I was particularly struck by the range from being press secretary for Martin Luther King's March on Selma in 1965 to a humanitarian mission to Kosovo and Macedonia in 1999. Um, so we're talking today about Drawdown. I'll let him tell you more about it, but I think um, the overall idea that I want to say is I really hope that everyone here today will take this idea really deeply into yourselves and um, go out into the world and think about what we can do to make a difference. Thank you. Karen, that was a really beautiful introduction and also it was a really beautiful description of a perennial, but the the change that is occurring. Alice Waters very much led uh, one food revolution, if you will, um, in the Bay Area. And, um, but I feel like Perennial is leading another one, which is taking it to the next step, which is, like you said, not reduce less or, you know, which are very good things to do, of course. And, but I think you made a really good point, which is it actually weighs upon you <laughs> year after year ago. I'm doing less, I'm doing less, I'm doing less. Who wants to do less anyway, really? When you think about it, you want to do more. And so the psychology has been really upside down and backwards in terms of how the human mind, the human brain works and what motivates us. So I just really want to congratulate you and Anthony for being leaders, not just here, but you are, but I think you are in the whole country in terms of the vision that you have articulated and embody in perennials. So I just want to acknowledge that. And thank you for the Jewish Community Center. You know, in this sectarian world, isn't it beautiful to see a religion that opens itself up to the whole community and interacts with it? I just like, thank you. Um, um, it, it doesn't make divisions, it heals them and brings us together. Um, Drawdown is a, what we're here to talk about, um, it means literally, or in the, in, the, in the context of climate, it means um, that first time on a year-to-year -year basis, one year to the next, the greenhouse gases peak and go down, as opposed to stabilize, reduce, or slow down, or whatever. It means go the other way. And uh, I'm gonna explain why uh, I came to that. Um, this, um, I'll get back to it. This next slide is a little loud. This is a summer in Greenland. Um, this is a North Yemen ice research station. Um, people by scientists from 14 nations who uh, drill down um, the uh, ice uh, sheet uh, to bedrock. Um, and this is what it's like to be there. I was on a journalist on a royal fact-finding mission there in 2009. Um, hadn't hit bedrock yet. Um, but what's so interesting to me is because there's so much in this culture, at least this country, sort of dismissiveness of science. And uh, when you go to a place like this, you realize science, uh, scientists are not only brilliant, but they're brave. Mm. And um, there is a person who's been here for 10 years who is the go-to person about survival, what to do, the weather, you know, just, you only can stay here 90 days out of the year. And you have to get out of here. Um, and uh, he didn't follow his own advice a few weeks before. Uh, he went out, it was a whiteout. You're supposed to stay right where you are. He was underdressed and now he's a double amputee three weeks later. So this is what our scientists are doing to really get the best science on what's happening with respect to climate change and global warming. Um, and you sleep outside in these tents. It's minus 25. Uh, it's ridiculous when you have to get up and pee at night, I can't tell you. Um, but this is the only place where the weather is good. It's actually ice caves. And down here is where the work occurs every day. Um, and it looks a little bit like one of those B scientific you know, sci-fi movies, you know, where it came from the deep or something. And because they use coconut oil in the drilling rig to bring up the ice cores. And because the coconut oil does not interfere with the uh, readings, petroleum wood, 
And so when they bring up these cores, and I can show more of this, but these cores, uh, they're coming up and they're all steaming with this white milky liquid. It's so weird, you know, because you're so cold. And also blah, 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 blah. But anyway, what they can tell from this is extraordinary pollen temperature, sulfates from volcano eruptions, whether uh, which uh, hemisphere, bi hemisphere, you know, whatever, they can tell exactly where it came from. And this is really goes back to what it's about. It's about the Eemian period, and this is where we are supposedly with respect to CO2 levels, which are 407 ppm. The estimate given for pre-industrial levels was 280 ppm. The line you see, the dotted line, is um, 300 ppm, and humanity has never been here. Any form of our genus, you know, Homo erectus, Homo floridiensis, Homo sapiens, supposedly who we are, and that means wise. Uh, and uh, but we have never occupied in the last two million years this planet when it was over 300 ppm. So to say we know what's going to happen over 300 or 400 ppm is maybe great science, but it's still speculative. We just don't know because it's such a complex system. Um, but the fact is, this is actually what ppm is today because it's greenhouse gas equivalents. What the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii measures is CO2. It doesn't measure nitrous oxide. It doesn't measure methane. It doesn't measure hydrofluorocarbons. And this is CO2 equivalent. So we're at 490. Mm. Terra incognito, terra nova. We don't know where we are. So this goes back to the statement about drawdown, which is in my, what, since I learned about uh, climate change at Stanford Research Institute in 1974, the physics, the biophysics of it, We've been saying reduce, 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 stabilize, like less, you know, and uh, slow down. It's a little bit like saying we're going over a cliff and we should sort of slow down and go over the cliff slowly because it's sort of like Thelma and Louise, you know, like mm, let's just do it like this because w where is stability? Where is stabilization in this chart? Do you see it anywhere? We just went through Irma, uh, Irma. yeah, Maria, Katie. You know, I mean, where's stability? Where we are right now, there is no stability. You know, Dominica gone, Puerto Rico gone, you know. And this is only one degree centigrade above it. During the Eemian period, which you see circled right here, it was one to two Celsius higher than before the, the pre-industrial age, okay? One to two. At that time, the ocean was 20 to 30 feet higher. There was hippopotami lounging in the Thames River Delta. Kent and Sussex were underwater. There was giraffes and lions romping over Germany and Denmark, and crocodiles were in Alaska. That's one to two C. Now it took longer to get there. And the cause was very different than the combustion of fossil fuels. But I'm just saying is that the only thing that makes sense when you look at this is let's go back the other way. Nothing else could... I just don't understand the rhetoric around reduce or stabilization or mitigate. Have you heard that word? Let's mitigate. Do you know what it means? Think about it. You, I know what you think it means. It means to reduce the suffering <laughs> or severity. That's what it means. I think they mean militate when they say it. I think, but they use mitigate. Why would we want to reduce the suffering and the severity? Why would we want to go the other way? So this is what drawdown is about. Uh, Karen talked about Project Drawdown. We're a small NGO. This is how most people get their news about uh, climate. They get it in the headlines. The headlines are almost always based on good science, by the way. Um, the rest of it isn't. Um, and what you often get is clickbait, basically, next to it. And this clickbait is about the woman who basically uh, killed her husband with a frog ornament and wrapped him in plastic sheeting for 18 years and so forth. And so, you know, this is supposed to be what? Equivalent? Uh, and talk about, oh, I didn't, I sent a new slide, but it, there was clickbait yesterday and it talked about perennial and, the, and, and it was a beautiful article and next to it was a big ad of an African-American woman drinking Coca-Cola, right? And so this is what we're seeing is the way the public, maybe not you, but the way the public is getting information is sort of trivializing it in sort of way. You know, okay, the Tower Bridge is, wow, look, the Tower Bridge is still standing with that tsunami. I mean, and this one, 
you know, and this one they got the, they got it right about Coca-Cola this time, uh, pour it down the toilet. Um, but, you know, and this headline is true if you assume we don't do anything, by the way. If we don't do anything. So it's a kind of funny headline. It's good science, but so forth. And if you Google, you want to know what are the top solutions to global warming, reversing global warming, or addressing climate change. Literally, this is what you get. Two scientific organizations. The left-hand one from a Scientific American uh, could be called Proverbs. You might as well have Love Your Mother in there. I mean, it's like, for real, for sure, but, you know, move closer to work. I can't afford to live where I live now, you know, so, I mean, this idea that somehow people could do all these things so easily. Uh, and then on the right side, you know, use power strips in your home entertainment center. I don't know who is, who is, oh, my gosh, you know, 99.99% of the people in the world do not have a home entertainment center, so, um, you know, wash clothes in cold water, buy less stuff. I mean, this, this, what happens is you go back to those headlines, you go, whoa, 10,000 years, you know, all that, you know, you know and then in, in it's irreversible and we're screwed, okay? And then you go to individuals who say, well, what can I do? And you read a list like this, science-based, supposedly, which is really not, by the way. This is not science-based. This is belief-based. But it's under the aegis of science-based organizations. And so what happens is you feel what? You feel disempowered, guilt, maybe shame. I'm doing the best I can, but I have a mortgage. My husband just got laid off or whatever. The kids are in school. My mom has is in a rest home or you know, has Alzheimer's. We're doing the best we can. <laughs> in other words, most people are doing the very, very, very best they can. And so you mix shame, guilt with fear, threat, and doom, which those headlines do, because they want to adrenalize you, and you get what? Denial, numbness, you know, like turn off, just like can't handle this, sorry. Hope somebody else is doing it. And that's kind of where we are. So what I wanted to know, and then what became a we, I want to know is where do we stand? Where do we stand? Are we, is it game over? Maybe. Hmm? But I'd like to know that if it's true. I don't want to be doomsayed at all. And to me, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC assessments, one, two, three, four, five, the six comes, I think, next year, those assessments are one of the best scientific problem statements humanity has ever created. Extraordinary science. Extraordinary. Every time you see a headline, whether it's the New York Times or the Daily Mail, it doesn't matter the quality of the publication, generally speaking, it's a validation of the problem statement. So, yep, they got that right, because look what's happening, right? So what do you do when you have a great problem statement and you have validation of the problem statement? You go to the solutions. You, there's no point in beating yourself up about the severity of the problem or what you don't know in terms of the future because you can't, no one knows the future. And that's really what Drawdown is about. And we said, we wanted to know where we stood. So we created an NGO. We had no money, which is such a blessing. I want to say that again, which was such a blessing. I think that's true for startups and entrepreneurs as well. Too much money can kill you. And in our case, uh, it almost did. <laughs> But what we knew is that in order for our work to be credible, we needed to be a collaborative, a we, a community, not a small NGO in Sausalito. And our work that we set out to do, as Karen spoke, was to map, measure, and model the 100 most substantive solutions to reversing global warming. Why do we want to do that? Because it had never been done. After 40 years of, of climate change being very much in the public sphere, we've never done that. Not the top 50, not the top 20, not the top 75, not the top 16, whatever. We've never done that. Isn't that extraordinary? I, I mean, people say, ask me why. You can ask me why. I'll tell you I don't know. Um, it's an anthropological question. Why we got so... Uh, tied up about this, but then got our shoelaces tied together as well, 
and didn't just say, well, look, at this is where we stand. This is what we can do. This is the impact it will have. So what we measured was 80 solutions that are well in place. They're, we're doing them. We know how to do them. W.W. W. Granger stuff. No question. Or in the case of John and Perennial, like, I don't know, farm, you know, on the farm, in the woods, you know, in the city, whatever. These we know, and they're all scaling. Every one of them is scaling. So what we did is continue to scale them for 30 years. Could we achieve, if these scaled in 30 years, the reversal of global warming? That is the reversal of emissions into the atmosphere and start to draw them down. That's what we wanted to know. We didn't know by the way. We did 20 more solutions, which we call coming attractions. I'll show you a couple. But those solutions are valid scientifically, but there's no data to model them with. There isn't sufficient economic or peer-reviewed data. So, um, so this is who we are, partially. These are um, research scientists. These are drawdown fellows. They came from all over the world. We put the word out to respected in educational institutions to to solicit research fellows, brought on fellows. We were overwhelmed with responses. Uh, half PhDs, almost 40% women. It was a meritocracy. We weren't trying to be gender specific. 22 countries, six continents, all advanced degrees. And that became the core research of Drawdown. And, um, and along with that, we have um, uh, 128 advisors. John Wick, who is here, will speak with us. He's actually on our board now, but was an advisor before he was a board member. And, um, uh, and some of these names you recognize, some you don't, but they are botanists, biologists, engineers, architects, climatologists, uh, heads of business schools, you know, activists, religious leaders, writers, etc. Very, very broad and diverse uh, group of people. We even have Tom Brady and Giselle Bunchen as advisors, and they care deeply about this, so it's diverse. And what do we do? We do the math. It's really simple. We do the math. And to give you an example of what the math is that we do, this is a solution, geothermal. When we measure and model a solution, we measure and model it where it is applicable. Geothermal is not applicable in San Francisco. It's, <laughs> it's apl applicable in certain parts of California, though. Right? So, and on the left-hand side, uh, what you see um, is the rank, and the rank is determined by this. It's ranked by the number of gigatons, billion metric tons of CO2 or CO2 equivalent gases could be avoided by 2050 or, in the case of land use, sequestered, drawn down. So one or the other, depending on the solution. Food, by the way, is such an extraordinary solution because it does both. It stops putting it up there and brings it back down. That's why it is such, it is the most important sector. We'll get back to that. So every carbon number is based on peer-reviewed scientific literature, period. It's not, we, we have no inputs into this data drawdown, except we scaled it in a rigorous and reason, reasonable way. And then on net operating costs, you see it's a negative here. We're comparing it to the business as usual scenario of where would you get your electricity if it wasn't from geothermal, where it's applicable, it would be from coal or combined cycle gas. So we measured the price of the cost of that versus the cost of geothermal, and it turns out it's negative, and then we also measure the net operating savings, net savings, not total, um, over 30 years, and it's 1.0 trillion. So this is, I'm just going to show you a bunch of solutions really quickly, just, and the only reason to show you these is just to give you a sense of the diversity, and the conversation, I think all of you know that, has been every time somebody stands up and says, you know, uh, we can solve this, or we should solve this, or it's solar wind, solar wind, Elon Musk, and don't eat so many hamburgers. He's like, ah. Oh. And somehow, we're supposed to get a hall pass to the 22nd century if we do that, and we go, where am I in all that? You know? I guess I could put solar panels on my roof, you know? And burgers, whatever. You know, I mean, it just, like, and it's just, it's so untrue. Those are crucial solutions, crucial, but there's no scientific, mathematical backing that those four, or you can add some more of them, will get us to where we want to go at the end of the century. Nothing. We wanted to do the math, okay? Afforestation is where you put trees where there wasn't forest before. Pretty simple. 
This is high-speed rail. Um, this is indigenous people's land management. Nobody manages land better than the original inhabitants. Indigene, the noun of indigenous means the original inhabitant of land. Right? And they know where they live. <laughs> and they know how to take care of it. And the number below that is a critical number because they're sitting on that much carbon in the forests and lands that they protect and own. Um, and that is slightly more than the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere itself. We want to keep it where it is. This is improved rice production. Rice is a methane pro um, producer. Two different ways to do this that reduce methane by, by half and increase, uh, increase productivity. Um, this is onshore wind. On the imagery, we wanted to show, we wanted to break the stereotypes of the imagery. Normally on wind, you see a, a grassy green hill and up on top is the wind turbine and children are playing in the foreground with the wildflowers and who knows what else. And you go, oh my God, this is the future. And um, that's a terrible place to put a wind turbine. This is where you want to put them, where the weather is pissy and awful. Uh, this is the North Sea off Norfolk and the Sheringham Shoal. These are Siemens three megawatt wind turbines. Um, and so we wanted to break the stereotype about the imagery you know, and this is another one we wanted to break, and this not one. This is walkable cities. Um, this is uh, Buenos Aires. Um, and this stereotype about rooftop solar, and you see these drone shots of triple, gar tri triple car garages in Atlanta with all covered with solar panels. They're going, this doesn't give me a lot of faith in humanity. I'm sorry. It's like a new form of materialism. 10 kilowatt, 12 gigawatt kilowatt installations, you know. I have one in my home, it's two kilowatts. Two, two, and we don't pay any electrical charges. pg and &E still screws us, but we don't pay. <laughs> hope pg is not too strong. And um, this is rooftop solar, and this is an Uru woman in Lake Titicaca with her daughters. And she lives on a straw island. The straw has to be replaced every 90 days or the island will sink. And she was using kerosene to light up her hut at night so her daughters could study. So, her, And I just think one of the things that when we tend to go technoid about solutions, we overlook this tremendous hum, humane and kindness that we can do for each other and others in terms of regenerating and changing the world that we live in for the better as opposed to a fix, you know. This is bike infrastructure. We don't model bikes, bikes we know. If you create the infrastructure, people ride bikes. If you get killed on the road, people probably aren't going to ride bikes. And this is green roofs. This is net zero buildings. Nothing there because everything that makes a net zero building, we model elsewhere, insulation, LED bulbs, smart glass, etc. But important uh, solution. This is forest protection. The Kermode Bear and the Great Bear Forest in British Columbia that got protected last year with a ribbon cutting with Prince William. Um, again, look at that number in the bottom right, the amount of CO2 that's basically in biomass and below the soil in the uh, forests um, that uh, are supposedly protected or should be protected in both tropical and temperate zones. Clean cook stoves, again, carbon black is not a gas, it's actually a particle, it's one of the strongest warming things you could do in the atmosphere, it only lasts a year or so, but it produces a huge rise in temperature where uh, people do not have clean cook stoves. Um, this is about women's safety, the well-being, the well-being of their lungs, their children's lungs. It goes on and on. This one is what, one of the things Karen talked about. <laughs> this is plant-rich diet. Um, what, we, what did we model? Good question. Why? What, how can you model that? This is not vegan or vegetarian. If you choose to be, it is. But it modeled is reducing the amount of protein intake in the so-called developed countries from 110, 100 you know, grams per day to a healthy 50, 60 grams, depending on activity, age, weight, and increasing it where there is uh, basically chronic shortages, nutritional shortages of protein and calories for that matter. And then replacing a significant amount of animal protein with the vegetable protein. OK, 
okay? And it's the number four solution. Um, and, um, but as, again, as I told you, it's such a good introduction, you, you covered everything, basically. It makes a healthy human being, and it makes a healthy earth. It does both. It's not like, oh, well, let's get healthy, or let's, you know, conserve, or do this. Let's do both. Do the same thing. This guy is at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the former accounting firm for the Oscars. And um, <laughs> mm, he's waving goodbye to the, no, he's, uh, to the contract. Yeah. He's waving to, he's in Montreal, he's waving to Ivan in Prague. And, and Ivan just logged on all by himself. He didn't need anybody's permission. Logged on to his iPad on a modified Segway and gets on and then scoots around the office in Montreal, can go to meetings, can go to your door. And, Hello, this is Ivan. I mean, he can show up, he could be in the back of the audience right now. So this is, what this is is a transport solution called telepresence, which is let's ship ideas more and more instead of protoplasm, it's people. Um, this is another food solution, number three. It's called reduced food waste. Uh, and this is a good time to bring up the, uh, the, the point that everything we did was conservative. Every single number you hear, see here was always with the bias of the conservative, the rate at which costs would go down, the rate at which it would scale, uh, the impact if there's a diverse uh, uh, amount of uh, literature, scientific literature on the impact. We always had a bias towards the, the low median. And, uh, and this is true too. This is reduced food waste. What it doesn't measure, it's number three, what it doesn't measure is methane emissions from land-filled food, which doesn't happen because of ecology, but it happens all over the world. And it's, uh, 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 methane is 28 to 34 times more potent, uh, greenhouse gas, than CO2. If we added that, if we could measure it, we don't know how to, Belgium, Botswana, you know, I mean, Berlin, we just don't know how to, we didn't have the data, so we didn't measure it, but it would be much higher. And this is household recycling, also ecology, but she, they do it differently here. The Dasanak people in Ethiopia, they built a bridge across the river and, um, from them, and they built a bar for the men who are building the bridge, and the women go uh, every day to look what the men threw away at night. <laughs> SIM cards and beer caps mostly, but you know, anything, watch bands, they, they'll take it all and they make uh, jewelry, headdresses and so forth. And now they sell it to boutiques in France. So love that one. This is, these are just four quick coming attractions, no data points here. This is marine permaculture, which is basically putting in recycled PET frames underneath the water, 25 feet under the water. Um, uh, or lower, depending on if it's a sea route or not. And basically, these, these tubes that go down to the thermocline, the cold, nutrient-laden waters that are everywhere in the ocean, um, that are actuated by the rise and fall of the sea itself. So there's no mechanical parts itself. There's no uh, inputs required. And brings up this cold water into these frames. And basically, you get a trophic cascade. You start to get this amazing regeneration of water, 99.99% of marine tropical waters are marine deserts. No life at all, you can see straight down for 100 feet. Why, there's no life. And what's happened, 93, 4, 5%, we're not sure, but basically of the warming that's occurred thus far has gone into the ocean, not land, it's gone into the ocean. And so what that's doing is creating these heat blankets, which we had here in California, uh, two, three years ago, basically, that basically inhibits the thermocline coming up, and that's why I had a big loss of the pinniped population dying, uh, because there was no food. So this, what this does is within weeks you see uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, algae, kelp, um, feeder fish, forage fish, and, and they went off in Hawaii, north of Hawaii, and they had a whale shark there within six weeks or so. So this is Dr. Brian Van Herzen, uh, uh, and these can reverse coral bleaching they, because they cool the water and they take out the carbonic acid at the same time. Nothing takes carbon out of, well, in this case, the water, but out of the environment faster than kelp, faster than any land plant. This is repopulating the mammoth steppe. This is just an exquisite story of two biologists who 
realized that the Mammoth Steppe, that subarctic circle, was once populated by millions and millions and millions of ruminants and predators and the woolly mammoth as well. But they want to bring them back because basically what animals do in a subarctic circle is brush the snow away in the winter to eat the dead browse underneath. And if they do that, it lowers soil temperature by two degrees Celsius, which is a permafrost protection plan. So you repopulate, you bring the animals back, and you also have an insurance policy for humanity in terms of the clathrates, which are buried underneath and are starting to defrost and melt. This is building with wood. This is so counterintuitive. Uh, wood buildings don't burn. Steel and concrete buildings do. From the, read the book. <laughs> it's got the references on the website. You don't have to read the book, by the way. You can go to the website, it's all there. There's 5,000 references to back up what's in the book. Uh, as well as technical references and so forth. But this is Yale and others who've done it. It has a huge impact on the environment. Yale says 14 to 31 percent reduction in carbon emissions if we built with wood instead of steel and concrete. Uh, there are now 20 plus story buildings built of, entirely of wood. Um, and um, um, cool. This one. <laughs> is the last one. This is called The Cow Walks Onto a Beach. And um, it, uh, it, it's, it refers to a solution that came from a dairy farmer in Prince Edward Island who noticed that the cows, his dairy cows that ate seaweed, produced less methane. And as you know, a ruminant, uh, ruminants produce an extraordinary amount of methane, are one of the top causes of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's over a billion of them uh, exhaling every day. Um, and the question is why? And he asked the county agent who said he didn't know, asked a scientist who said it must be because if they're producing more milk, they must be producing less methane. Because methane is a very taxing metabolic process that is not actually uh, uh, original to the ruminant, actually. It came in sometime, a bacteria came in and populated the rumen and basically made itself at home. Um, and the byproduct of digesting cellulose is methanes, methane. And so they did an experiment where they divided the herd and fed some kelp and some not, and they put bags over their head and um, measured the exhalations five times a day, and sure enough, okay. But it was a science experiment, so what? What do you do? You can't have kelp and feed them to the Harris Ranch on five, <laughs> you know. Uh, but you driven by there? It's like, you can't do that to CAFOs, you can't do that. You can, we don't have enough kelp, and we're not growing it anyway. So they, they got together, he got together with a scientist he heard about in Australia who's doing the same work. And they discovered an algae called Asparagopsis taxiformis, which is what native Hawaiians eat, which in a 2% supplement to feed will reduce uh, methane emissions in cows, sheep, and goats by 70 to 90%. And the reason we show coming attractions I, is that we modeled 80 that are in place, scaling, and showed that we could re reach drawdown by 2050, by 2045 even. But what we wanted to convey is that humanity is on the case, that there's these extraordinary people everywhere who are changing their business, whether it be a restaurant like Perennial, changing technologies, their farms, architecture, transport, I mean, that are reimagining the world and our relationship to it so that it is not degenerative development but regenerative development. And we shouldn't, we don't know that. What we know is the, what the news as it comes at us, which is distressing and, and disturbing in some cases. Um, but we don't know the other half, the real half of humanity, which is that it cares, it's compassionate, it's genius, um, it's innovative, um, and it's on the case. And what surprised us? Well, that we didn't know. That's, we didn't know this at all. Uh, we didn't know the top five, 10, 20 solutions. When the, I got, um, this, we did the numbers. We finished in February, two months before the book was published. We had the plates so we could put the numbers in at last, the last moment, ship them off to Penguin. And when we saw the numbers, we didn't believe it ourselves. We were shocked in a good way, but still shocked. It's just nothing that we predicted or saw. Our nose was pressed at the glass for two and a half years, and we just didn't see it because the models are all 
system dynamical, and therefore when we hit the total button, it was like, whoa, okay? But it's so interesting because at that time I got a call from one of the 100 top scientists in the world on climate change, and the person said, how's it going? I said, it's great. And uh, guess what? We just got the numbers. And you know, I said, what do they say? I said, we're shocked, you know? And, and I, you know, I said, then I said something which just, I said, you know, I don't think anybody in the world knows the top five solutions to climate change. No one. Not Christiana Figueres, not Ban Ki-moon, not Jeffrey Sachs. You name the people who are in leadership and doing a great job, by the way. I don't think one of them can name the top five. And the person said, what are they? <laughs> I said, you tell me. And it was so interesting. I wish I recorded the conversation. Because the person talked out loud. said, oh, OK, right, great, yeah, OK. And they went right to ma rapid transit. Well, rapid transit, oh, oh, no, no, EVs. Urgent EVs. No, no, EVs. Oh, let's see. Well, and they just kept talking that way. And da -da 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 -da, solar. Da -da -da -da. I was just listening. And it would have been my mind, by the way, two years ago, too. Like, you know, and finally he said, OK, one, two, three, four, five. Not in order, just five, who would be the five, top five. And said, how did I do? And I said, that wasn't the point of the question. <laughs> what was the point of the question? The point of the question is, you're one of the top 100 people in the world, published, pro professor, IPCC lead author. I mean, you got it all gone. And look how long it took you to name five solutions. Yeah, right. I said, and then they said, how did I do? I said, they're all wrong. That's where we are. He's a wonderful person, by the way. So I not, I'm not criticizing anybody here. I'm not criticizing that person. I'm just saying this is where we were, in a miasma of ignorance about what we can do and what we are doing, more to the point. So. Eight of the top 20, 11 of the top 25, but eight of the top 20 are food-related. Who knew? Um, there's food. The underneath is energy generation, by the way. It's not liquid fuels for transport, but bigger than, you know, basically coal and gas, you know, in terms of energy generation, uh, at, in terms of impact. Um, uh, the top solution was refrigerant management. Such a disappointment to us. We want something sexy. <sighs> anyway, we did the numbers on it over and over again and discovered that they were low uh, because we didn't include the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol that phases out HFCs. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Um, and then electricity generation is five of the top 20. And then if you add 22, which is offshore wind, it becomes number one. It surmounts refrigerant management. And then came this little girl, this little beauty, um, number six educating girls. And um, this is basically a pathway to family, and plan, family planning that's about the empowerment of a girl becoming a woman on her terms. Because if she's taken out of school, which they often are around the world, to work, to put their brother through school, or to be early marriage, uh, or, um, then they have about five plus children, and their economic circumstances are impaired. That means their health and education of their children is impaired. Um, and this becomes sort of a, a vicious cycle. Um, but if she's allowed to stay in school and supported, not just allowed, but supported uh, to, to matriculate to 11th, 10th, you know, 11th, 12th grade, she makes very, very different choices. She has an average of two children. She's much better off economically because of her education. She earns more. She puts those resources into her children. Sons and daughters repeat that pattern. Um, and so the number you see, the 59.6 gigatons, um, is basically based on the UN median and high population figures in 2050. Not our numbers, by the way. The UN numbers. And that's coupled with this, which is family planning clinics available for all women everywhere to support their reproductive well-being health and family planning. And you put these two together, basically, and uh, six and seven, and that is the number one solution to reversing global warming, which is empowerment of girls and women. 
And again, who knew? And I remember when somebody asked me a question, I said, it's not a solar panel, it's a woman. You know? And I just felt like, <laughs> we just, how did we get so lost? It's not that solar panels aren't crucial, they are, they are. But somehow, we got this all confused. This is what the solutions look like in a pie chart. And there's no such thing as a small solution. We talk about the big ones, but it's a system that caused the problem. It's a system that will heal it. It's everything. No such thing as a small solution. Really important to understand. This is the book. The most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Uh, this came from a Stanford intern working at Penguin uh, last summer, not this summer, the one before. And I said, no, no, no. That's not, we don't do plans here. We do mapping and measuring and modeling, you know, we're analysts, you know. And I looked at it, I left it on my desk and it was for the Verso, for the back cover, and I said, no, 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 no. My editor kept asking me about it, but the more I looked at it, the more I realized it was right, actually, that it was good. And it's good for two reasons. One is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed. All right, well, it is because no one's ever proposed one. Right? I'm thinking of the other adjectives we could have put there now, you know, brilliant, nuanced, <laughs> literate, <laughs> whatever. I mean, there is no other plan to reverse global warming. Again, astonishing. And plan is not our plan. What I think we did is discover that humanity has a plan. It's not top down. It doesn't come from Paris, Marrakesh, or COP23 in Bonn. It doesn't come from Princeton or the UN. It doesn't come from a charismatic white male vertebrate doing movies, okay, who is very privileged and has a private aircraft and goes around and is a star. That's not where the solutions come from. Good for them for what they do, but it comes from all of us. It comes from the middle out. It's not even bottom up. It's everywhere emanating outwardly. We do have a plan. That doesn't mean we can't do better, accelerate, make it go faster, inform, educate, bring in more coming attractions. We can do that too. But we have a plan. There is a plan. It just doesn't come from where we tend to look for love in all the wrong places, um, especially when we look at the beltway. And it's just not, it's not where love is coming from. You know, I'm kind of with, um, well, I mean, oh, I'll save that for maybe question and answer. But this, I just want to show this really quickly. Draw down, this is what happens every year. This is the NASA simulation of carbon. It gets more and more darker, the, 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 the red and the, you know, the sort of vermilion and very burnt color means more CO2 concentration. And then in the middle of the year, it flips. It gets bluer and you get oxygen because of spring in the north and farms and grasses and trees and bushes and shrubs start to eat CO2 and emit oxygen. So you see this reversal starting in April, May, and then June, July, it gets big in August, right? We draw down every year, six to seven ppm. Drawdown happens every year. It's not like out there somewhere in 2050. It's now. We're drawing down right now on, on Earth and it'll soon flip, you'll see. So, it's drawdown is really about just getting it sort of recalibrated. It's a huge task, you know, in terms of our emissions being less than those that the Earth can recycle and bring back. Uh, and um, I think for the sake of time, I'll skip this. It's a good one. Uh, <laughs> and just talk about, oh, no, I think I'll talk about this, which is really about language. Can we just change our language, please? Can we stop fighting climate change? So crazy term. The climate is supposed to change. In your body, you have a bunch of quadrillion cells, 90% of which are bacteria. My wife has a t-shirt that says, mostly bacteria learning to be human. <laughs> <laughs> and you have one septillion things going on every second like this in your body, one septillion, more than all the stars in the known universe, you are changing it's one septillion times every single nanosecond. You are, you're just one person. What do you think the climate's doing? What do you think nature's doing? What do you think an oak tree's doing? I mean, 
everything is changing in such a magnificent, exquisite, beautiful way and we come up with some term like we're going to fight climate change. Come on. Oh, you can't fight change anyway. You can just be diluted. Combat the climate battle, the climate crusade, the war on carbon, the carbon war of them slashing emissions with what? Machetes? I mean, you know, and then the term negative emissions and decarbonization as being a solution. Decarbonization is the name of the problem. We decarbonize this place and we put it up there. That's not the name of the solution. It's recarbonization, it's bringing it back home, so forth. Um, and lastly, this guy, this is our most famous uh, scientist we work with, Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, spoiler alert, he's back, by the way. Uh, he did come back. And, but you remember at the end of the movie in The Martian where he's going to a wannabe astronaut class and, and he's the Amanos Gris, the guy who came back and he's been around the block. And, um, and then he's asked to talk and he said, listen up. He said, pay attention because this could save your life. And he said, when I was up there, did I think I was going to die? Absolutely. Space does not cooperate. The atmosphere does not cooperate. I'm saying that, right? doesn't care what we think. At some point, everything is going to go south on you. Um, and you're going to think and believe, this is how I am. This is how I am. My life. And it says, you can either accept that or you can go to work. And um, he said, you do the math. I love that part. <laughs> he said, you do the math. You solve one problem and then you solve the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. And that's what this is about. Let's come home. It's our home. It's so exquisite, so beautiful, so magnificent, beyond our comprehension in our lifetime. And so really, reversing global warming is an extraordinary opportunity and you have to ask yourself this, which is, is climate change happening to you? Are you the victim, the object? This is a terrible thing. You've got the short end of the stick. You're born the wrong time. People, do, if you think that way, you're going to sue Exxon, demonize others, blame, and get into big fights on Twitter. If you understand, basically, and change the preposition that climate change is happening for us, it's a gift. It's an offering. Any system, and it is a system, this beautiful earth, that any system that does not respond to feedback dies. Whether it's a business, or city, or country, whatever, it dies. So this feedback is an offering for us to reimagine what it means to be a human being here on Earth, on this beautiful place. And when you understand it that way, then you can stop blaming people, stop demonizing as a waste of time, and work on the solutions, on innovation, on creativity, and doing things uh, like Anthony and Karen are doing at Perennial. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, as I mentioned, was very uh, inspired by Project Drawdown. In a way, it's actually not one project. I mean, it is one project, but it's a project composed of many smaller projects. So we're going to talk um, about several smaller projects, specific projects motivated by this desire to uh, reverse climate change. Um, that are right here in the Bay Area. So I'm uh, very pleased to introduce to you um, a, a panel of speakers um, who I'll bring up after a film that we're going to have in lieu of a speaker. Um, many of you know Albert Strauss of Strauss Family Creamery has been a leader in um, sustainable dairy uh, ranching um, for decades. Um, and. Uh, Though he's not here today, we do have a short film from Strauss about the, um, the dairy's uh, creation of the first full-scale electric 
uh, truck uh, powered entirely by cow poop. Um, so just a project that um, has implications beyond that particular um, dairy. Um, we, uh, after the film, will welcome Robert Reed, a spokesperson for Recology about the work they're doing, John Wick, a rancher and co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project, and Anthony Mient, who is not only my husband, but also a restaurateur and a very passionate activist for regenerative agriculture and also working on a project to educate a particular girl. Um, so um, let's um, enjoy this film from Strauss and then the panel will come to the stage. Thank you. The mission of Strauss Family Creamery is support and sustain organic dairy farms in Marin Sonoma County by producing the highest quality minimally processed organic products. What I've tried to do is create a model of a sustainable farming system that is good for the earth, the soil, the animals, and the people working on these farms. We've done a lot of things to show that farming is part of the solution to climate change. So a methane digester is a piece of equipment, essentially in our case it's a covered lagoon that takes all the cow's waste, captures the methane from that waste, to produce electricity for the farm. And now we created an electric feed truck, the first one in the world, to feed the cows, and it's powered by the cow's waste. The cow's waste produces electricity that charges the batteries, that drives the motor, that mixes the feed, and feeds it back to the animals. It has to be reliable, it has to be working every day of the year, and it has to be, in my mind, a sustainable, non-polluting, part of our farming system because we are looking at a bigger picture of how can we have less impact on the on the planet. The electric truck, the methane digester, carbon farming, the sustainability practices are all part of this bigger vision and this bigger mission to to make a practice that will succeed to the next generation. We're showing as a model of farming that this is a solution to climate change that can be replicated not only locally but throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I just love community meetings and, um, and talking about the environment. I was a journalist uh, for 10 years and I've been at Recology for 25 years. And I, like all of you, I've got a curious mind. And I was lucky enough to be invited by a filmmaker named Cyril Dion to uh, Paul Hawkins' pre-book launch in Oakland earlier. Uh, this year, I believe, and um, was tremendously inspired. And, and um, I can tell you, because of all the things I've read about carbon being absorbed into the oceans and the oceans becoming more acidic and all these things, a lot of these things that Paul pointed out are, are very, very true and right on the money. And it's just so exciting to be here in San Francisco uh, and having him do this here. So thank you very much. I want to be very brief here. I just want to be supportive today. Uh, but I, I felt I offered to show a few things. So we do a presentation about <clears throat> trying to model nature because nature has so many wonderful solutions to our challenges. This is a picture of some coffee grounds. And it's just here because, you know, coffee grounds and tea leaves are in so many kitchens. And coffee is grown in the tropics. and. We take all those nutrients away from those farms and we ship at great distances. It's got a tremendous footprint. And it's very rich in nutrients and minerals. And so we need to get those minerals back on the farms and on ranches where they can do good in the form of compost. And uh, I have a colleague that calls coffee grounds the gateway drug to composting because they don't, they don't smell, there's no odor, and it smells nice. And so it's a great way to get people to start composting in their kitchens and then of course, um, as they go along, they can add things like fish bones if they eat fish. Uh, again, something that's very rich in nutrients and, and decomposes very quickly. It uh, came from the earth, it needs to go back to the earth. Uh, you'll also see a, a, a citrus there. And when we do large scale composting, we can 
compost things that you can't compost in your backyard, um, things like citrus and vegetable peelings. Um, here's a picture of, of the finished compost, and you'll see that the particles here are really small. Um, if you look here on the, on the thumb, you see um, that it's, it's almost like a dust, a very small pieces. So those small pieces, as John Wick knows, because of his work with compost, they're immediately available to the microbial colonies, to the microorganisms in the topsoil. And so farmers, rancher, ranchers like John and farmers love to see those small pieces. So we've been fortunate in San Francisco to be able to advance our composting program to make a high quality compost with these really small pieces. Um, we've been doing this since 1996. And here's a picture from the end of our process. This is the blending pad. Um, and so down here you've got the immature compost. And, and you'll notice in the bucket of the tractor it's a little reddish, it's a little rouge. So that's because that's redwood sawdust. So um, at a, um, a lumber mill they might look at sawdust as a waste product, but we see it as a very valuable soil amendment. And so we have nine different amendments here at this blending pad gypsum lime, sandy loam, redwood sawdust, and, and minerals, and other things. And so uh, we, the, the farmers and the ranchers work with agronomists that test their soil. Um, John works with a wonderful scientist at Berkeley named Dr. Wendy Silver. And they can, uh, you know, every time you harvest, you take all these nutrients and minerals away from the farm, and you have to put them back. And so an agronomist will do the soil samples and identify what needs to be put back to get those to try to get those soils back in balance, kind of modeling nature, and so we bring the, that that lab report here and we try to make them a custom blend to get a good match for what they need. So a lot of thought goes into this. Um, I'm so pleased to, to that Paul's uh, presentation so much hi highlights food and agriculture because. Um, yes, food, doing it right, um, brings carbon back down into the soil and produces more food. And as he mentioned, it also keeps food scraps out of landfills. So you start to add these things together. He's, you know, uh, brilliant, obviously, with numbers. But you start to add these pieces together, one, two. And then a third piece being you're, you're avoiding putting it in landfills. You're avoiding creating not only methane but other landfill gases, which are, as he said, 20 and 25 times more potent than CO2. And so the, the net is really impactful. Um, and here's a picture of the compost at a vineyard. Um, and we, we brought them some compost and they called us three days later and they said, God, you gotta come, you gotta come take the pictures. Well, we thought something was wrong when we went there and they were very excited because the earthworms were drawn immediately to the compost. So this is a sign of health in any garden. And when I see those worms, I just think of them as an example of the microorganisms of the life in the soil. Um, so nature is telling us this is a good thing. Um, and almost done now. This um, picture is from a vineyard that uses the compost. And everyone looks at the grapes and goes, oh gosh, I wanna eat those grapes. A farmer looks at the whole health of the plant and you see the leaf is perfectly formed and the, the stem that comes into the grapes there is very purple, it's very supple like the veins in your wrist. That's only possible by having healthy soil and so we're feeding the microbes in the soil, the topsoil with the compost. This is Nigel Walker who passed away recently. He was a uh, organic farmer here and um, was a great leader in the Bay Area in this movement. These are tomato plants on his farm, but look at the health of the plants, not just the heirloom tomatoes, but look at the health of the plants. They're doing photosynthesis, right? They're pulling down a lot of carbon. They're, as John said, they're putting oxygen back up in the air. And you guys are helping do this stuff because you're composting your coffee grounds and your food scraps. And now Paris and New York and lots of other places are starting to copy the program. Okay. Uh, this is Chateau Montalina, which is a Napa. vineyard north of Napa. And in the United States, we grow vines vertically for grapes, and there's a hallway in between the vines. It's two meters wide. 
And uh, we're putting compost there, and we're using that compost in this hallway to grow cover crops like mustard and beans and uh, something called brass button. There's over a dozen different ones. And these crops are very good at pulling carbon and nitrogen out of the atmosphere and fixing it in the soil, like the grasses that John grows uh, using compost. Um, and so in this way, one final thought, okay. So this is how we are um, turning vineyards into carbon sinks. And so I really encourage you guys to compost your food scraps so we can do a lot more of this. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do my thing here. Can you hear me? Um, 2007, it's been 10 years. Uh, we made an observation on our ranch north of here in Nicasio that we thought suggested we were increasing soil carbon, but we lacked a way to measure it. And that's why we brought scientists into our system. And the, the idea of measuring, mapping, and modeling is critically important if you're trying to, mon or to manage something. And so over the last 10 years, we've developed a whole suite of approaches to producing agriculture based on measured results. And it's called carbon farming. And across the state of California now, through the Governor's Healthy Soils Initiative, we're enjoying state funding, paying for implementation of building healthy soils based on an entire suite of practices known to be climate beneficial. So the clothes I'm wearing are, are a great example. This shirt was just made a week or so ago from wool produced on a ranch in Northern California. We know that one pound of this wool removed six pounds of carbon from the atmosphere. So it's net climate beneficial. The cotton is from Cape Bay Valley, Sally Fox. And so we have physical evidence in our fiber, but food is the, is the thing we actually enjoy more. And um, here we are today talking about food as a climate solution. Okay, guys, I want to start really quick with something small and then go into something big. So the small thing is uh, at Mission Chinese Food, uh, 10 cents from each diner goes towards uh, projects in the food system that reduce greenhouse gases. Um, so this would be things like the efficient cook stoves, um, things mentioned in uh, Paul's great work, Drawdown. Uh, and then quick aside, you know, I feel like I, I'm almost like shaking because that was very moving. So thanks for the great talk. Um, you know, so the question here is that 10 cents. Uh, can anybody here imagine not choosing a restaurant like Mission Chinese Food or something um, because the 10 cents? You know, I can't really imagine that. Uh, there's a three Michelin star restaurant in the city, Bennu. Um, at Bennu, Corey Lee's a great chef, and he's taken a real leadership position and made all his restaurants carbon neutral um, through the same concept. It's 35 cents for like a $300 meal of a lifetime. And so to me, the question is, uh, if this feels intuitively reasonable to us, why are we not doing this? So, you know, I want to just, we saw the visualization of uh, drawdown over the seasons. I feel like if we saw a visualization of, you know, and we saw like a line chart with CO2 spiking super high, I feel like if we saw a visualization of like the evolutionary force of capitalism, you know, what would that look like? Uh, you know, you could imagine capitalism as like the most powerful evolutionary force. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, in a way, if you're at McDonald's and you make your own, know, you know, decision maker, you decide like, oh, we're gonna put in a bunch of solar panels and compostable packaging. If the company loses money, you get sued and, and it's over. No one is making that decision. Uh, capitalism is basically directly at odds with environmentalism. The cheaper you can operate, the better you are as a capitalist uh, in a way. And so, you know, the person who says, 
like, oh, voting with your consumer dollar doesn't matter or that kind of stuff, that's the same thing that Paul is saying. Like, this is, everything is wrong. You know, uh, in farming, currently $200 billion from each farm bill goes towards what I would call bad farming, like industrial chemical based farming. Uh, $1 billion, uh, this is every farm bill every five years, $1 billion total goes to new organic or sustainable farming. And so not only is like the environmentalist farmer who's like literally saving their little part of the world struggling against capitalism to begin with, they're also struggling against that market distortion of the government subsidy. Uh, that's why the cherry tomatoes are $5 versus $1. And that's why, like, I used to think of food as this bourgeoisie thing, and now I think of it as, like, a very activist and very important thing. Um, I, I'm just going to skip all my slides, but so I'll just close by saying that <clears throat> I feel like, um, you know, uh, from what Paul was saying, there's a sense of, like, enormity and urgency, but also uh, possibility. Um, I think in previous times there were these progressive liberal agendas uh, like abolitionism, you know, or the women's right to vote. Uh, and I just wonder if we will look back on this time of farming as like, oh, can you believe no one even cared about healthy soil? Uh, we're literally like spraying poison on the food. Um, so, you know, I think the question is, uh, what can we do as consumers? And I think the answer is learn more about healthy soil and draw down and these kinds of opportunities to make a difference. I want to thank all of you for coming here on a really beautiful day. Um, and I want to invite you to continue the conversation in the atrium, get your book signed by Paul, um, play around with the scale that gives you a sense of the carbon footprint of relative, um, the relative carbon footprint of different ingredients, and then go home and work in your garden a little bit, work on some healthy soil, um, and, um, and really think about um, what concrete steps we can each take to move toward Jordan. Thank you. Should buy buy books for Christmas presents now. Early Christmas presents, sign book, and give out five books. And thank you, Karen, Anthony, Robert, Paul, and John for being here today. Appreciate you.